Hi, welcome back to my channel, Richard Tang, CEO of Zen Internet. Today, I am delighted to invite to our HQ in Rochdale, Whale Sabah, the founder and managing director of Strategic Imperatives. Whale, very warm welcome. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. Strategic Imperatives. Let's start with the company, the history. You founded the company. Tell us a bit about it. Okay, I'll give you a brief introduction. So Strategic Imperative was founded in 2005. Uh, when uh, we saw an opportunity with OpenReach being created as an entity and a sort of big scale change in how to access the OpenReach network. And we started by uh, developing a gateway to the OpenReach network. So if I mention some historical names for you, Carphone Warehouse, Tiskeli, Pipex, Cable and Wireless. So we ended up with all these organizations using our gateway to connect to the uh, OpenReach to roll out their LLU proposition which for a startup company was a major achievement. Uh, we then took that platform, uh, added uh, to it a sort of a layer on top of that to allow sort of APIs, orchestrations, and created our WR3 solution, which uh, I think over time has become probably the primary WR solution in the UK. We had 230 service providers using the platform. Uh, Zen, of course, is one of them. Yeah, we've been uh, using your platform for many for, years. For, for many years, but also... You know, TalkTalk, Talk, Vodafone, Plusnet, uh, Geocom, Daisy. So pretty much 80% of the UK line rental was managed by our platform outside BT Retail. And Plusnet, as you know, is you know, it's part of the BT group. So it's uh, no mere feat to get them to use our platform to connect the BT network. Uh, 2015, uh, we launched uh, Elevate, our billing and monetization platform. And again, we saw a market dominated by legacy platforms. Everything is sort of slow, desktop based, and we provided the channel's first real time cloud native platform. And two years ago, uh, the Fiber Cafe, which is probably why we're primarily here to discuss uh, as well. So, uh, a quite a long history. Uh, and if you think, you know, where we sit in the channel, we are at the heart of the channel ecosystem and have been for the last 12, 13 years. Yes, let's talk about Fiber Cafe. I think that's the Mm -hmm. hottest topic for this interview. Yeah. So where did the idea come from and what is it? Okay, well, the idea is not as new as it looks because in the very early days, I, I've got a presentation from 2011 where we turned up to the Ministry of Culture in the early days of BD UK and presented the concept of providing a standardized centralized gateway uh, for the multitude of um, alternates, although at the time I didn't think there would be 100 plus of them uh, at the time. Um, I think we went through several meetings, but that was not seen as a priority at the time, and it was not seen as the business of BD UK. Uh, so the idea also was, was put on ice, but it never disappeared. And it sort of came back about three years ago when um, uh, Talk Talk, what now PXC, uh, approached us to uh, see if we can work with them uh, on the uh, alternate aggregation platform. And we, you know, we work with TalkTalk Talk and PXC uh, for many, many years uh, as well through provisioning, uh, LED integration and so on. And also there was a number of organizations coming up like Broadband Hub and uh, Common Wholesale Platform, etc. So it was not dissimilar to the early days of EMP where something big is happening. Uh, and a, this is a time for a technology platform to come in and make use of that. So that's really the, the Fiber Cafe was born from that. And we had uh, PXC or Talk. I'm going to refer to it as PXC, as PXC today, but at the time it was Talk Talk. Uh, uh, came to us as an anchor customer of the platform uh, that was driven the initial part of the roadmap uh, as well. And the Fiber Cafe, in its simplest form, is a unified gateway with a vision for it into the UK uh, ecosystem. So we provide a unified interface, API, customer journey, uh, customer update, notifications, etc., that allows you to have one technology stack. Um, so you do not need to integrate separately. Um, uh, it's one, one interface. And I think one of the most important things that was at the talk, at the beginning of the Fiber Cafe was, if you need an if statement to determine who the supplier is, then we fail. So we've developed our APIs based on really truly transforming and unifying that customer journey. Right. And, and uh, has your unified int mm. interface influenced the way that the network providers have actually provided their service to they, you? It has indeed. So many of them have adopted our interface 
uh, as well. So we, we've gone for very much an open approach. Our documentation is open. Uh, everything we do is available from a technical uh, documentation perspective to the industry as well. And we're also part of the standard groups and we take part in some and we lead others as well. Uh, so if you look at the interfaces developed, for example, by Truly, then it is based on our API as an interface from a number of other alternates as well. So uh, it certainly has uh, influenced how they're doing. And we're doing the same with, so that was lead to cash, and we're now doing the same with trouble to resolve as well, uh, where uh, we're seeing a very ripe environment to come in and provide work with the industry to create a standard in that space as well. Yeah, and, and very needed, I think, because it's easy to get the, well, it's easier to get the orders done, but you've still got to manage. You, you still got to manage, and it's always an afterthought because the initial focus is lead to cash. But yeah. with that automation, you cannot scale. Uh, you cannot, with that automating T2R, you cannot scale your business. If you're having to go on portals, and especially if you have more than one network, if you've got yeah. two or three or four networks, it gets much harder uh, to scale and grow the business. Yeah. I, and I know there's been a lot of interest and in actually sign-ups from yeah. a variety of altnets. Yeah. I know truly Natomni have signed yeah. up as well. Um, how many have you got all together now as as signed up? I think we got networks? approximately twelve net twelve suppliers signed up. Now I think it's key to remember that you don't need to be a network to be a supplier. Okay. So, uh, uh, an aggregator. So, uh, organizations uh, such as Zen or PXC, they have a place, uh, place at both sides of uh, the Fiber Cafe as suppliers and, and potentially as consumers as well. Uh, the same, so we got BT Wholesale on the platform, for example. You can argue BT Wholesale does not have its own uh, network, even though yeah. uh, it's uh, Bicky Bags on the OpenReach network. So, effectively, uh, the, the vision for the Fiber Cafe is using the alternate uh, uh, scenario as a uh, jumping uh, ground. So we're using that to uh, build the vision of the Fiber Cafe, but it is not just alternates, it is uh, aggregators and other suppliers as well. Yeah, and, and then from the ISP side, PXC talked up was the anchor customer. PXC was the anchor is, customer. Is it a one-to-many or have you managed to sign up? Other yeah, yeah, so for example, I don't know, you probably recently read uh, Cuckoo and All Points Fiber have gone national. Okay. Uh, with their proposition. So that's yeah. using the Fiber Cafe right. to extend the footprint. Uh, we've got uh, organizations such as Red Centric, Talk Straight uh, have signed up. Uh, we do the provisioning for the likes of XLN for Soho as well. And you know, our customers come to us in part or uh, to simplify the initial journey because you know we are API specialists. We provide test environments, QA environments, etc. Mm -hmm. But what they gain is the agility to add other suppliers very quickly. So if you join us to go for BT Wholesale, then the decision to go for City Fiber, for example, becomes purely a commercial decision. You do not have to redo your stack. And um, you know, whilst people join us for BT Wholesale because we offer a very unique interest BT Wholesale, uh, certainly many in the back of their mind, even though they don't have an immediate requirement, they see access to the other networks as being of significant interest and for their agility. And you know, with our approach, we're focusing on bringing in board suppliers that add incremental um, uh, premises. So we look at the open reach network, we've done an analysis where the overbuilds are and so on. So you'll see, if you look at our suppliers like you know, Truly or Fennel, Natomni and so on, each of these do benefit from a significant uh, build area with little or no overbuild. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I think overbuilds a cardinal sin. Um, I was one of the CEOs, Jeremy, actually. That's right, yes. <laughs> he said that one. But look, that's the sentiment yeah. I've had from from many of them. And in, in terms of the critical mass of uh, suppliers and, mm -hmm. um, and ISPs, and how far are you, you know, have you reached that? How far so are you are before you say, you know, this is yeah. this has now reached our original business model? So we're certainly have reached, ultimately, with the, initially with the Fiber Cafe, it's a chicken and egg situation. You yeah. Know, start almost like you're launching a social media. Uh, you know, you need these people to be there and you're there and you're on your own sort of thing. So having uh, PXC as an anchor customer was certainly of help uh, for us in the early days. But from a supplier perspective, I think we're now at 22 million premises uh, from a fiber only. And we also do FTTC uh, as well. Okay. 
Uh, and I think we've got the critical mass, which is now attracting the ISPs as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've probably seen our uh, approach and our uh, marketing is, and our uh, releases is more about the ISPs joining the platform. And mm-hmm. we, I think we're asked a couple of stories over the last couple of weeks of new ISPs on the platform. So we're a critical mass on the supplier side, and we're certainly approaching critical mass on the ISP or consumer side. Yeah. Great. Now, this is the crux question, yeah. really, for this interview is, yeah. is w- there are 100 out- altnets out there at the moment. Yeah. So the case for having an aggregation platform yeah. that lets you access, you know, lets an ISP like Zen access, you know, 12, 20, 30, 40 different networks all through a single API is very compelling. Yeah. Everyone in the industry is, knows there's going to be this huge consolidation and when we get to 2030 or maybe a bit beyond, there might be as few as just one. Yep. You know, it might consolidate all the way down to one. One would be maybe an extreme situation. That, yeah. that would be an extreme situation. I don't think it would be just one. But the consensus seems to be it's not going to be more than two, three, maximum about four scale players and then maybe some rural players. Mm -hmm. So what happens to your aggregation platform when actually you might only have, let's say, two or three scale players to aggregate? Uh, That is a very good question. Uh, First of all, I'll remind you that Strategic Imperatives was built on a many-to-one relationship model. So we connect the entire industry, well, almost the entire industry, to the OpenReach platform um, today. So uh, with that, you you can argue why would... Vodafone or uh, yourself and so on uh, come through us is because we offer, you know, we're API experts. We offered uh, at the time uh, better uh, support than OpenReach. Uh, we offered environment, development environments that, that OpenReach didn't offer. And we also we shielded customers from breaking changes, etc. cetera. Um, and we've gone to from one, uh, many to one to many to many. There was never going to be the case where that many is going to be a hundred. No. Uh, you know, I, I think there was not viable, and even the hundred today, probably thirty, forty percent of them have not enough footprint to, uh, to be or to have an interest in offering wholesale access to their platform yeah. uh, as well. So, in terms of why you'd come to us, uh, in the short term, uh, you can take a almost a you remove the lottery of the aggregation. Uh, you know, you integrate the platform. And whatever happens, you're shielded from it. If you integrate with X, Y, and they acquired by Z, whatever happens, your integration certainly works uh, uh, from that. But then also you've got, uh, and I'll give you examples. Uh, today, we have quite a few customers on the BT Wholesale. Uh, 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 and they join us purely for the BT Wholesale uh, 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 integration. Now, where we, uh, beyond the experience that we offer, uh, where you see that uh, BT Wholesale have a, two technology stacks, B2B and their new BB1. And but our unified interface covers both. So as they move products across those stacks or migrate products across those stacks, then our customers just benefit. You do not need to worry about any of that. Uh, the same um, you got with uh, City Fiber. City Fiber is going through a process now of completely updating their interfaces. They're moving from their old SERP interface to their TM forum based interface. Uh, for our customers, it is they don't have to do anything. Um, they they for them that migration will happen, and they don't have to invest as as part of that process as well. And also, I'll take you back to what I said earlier. We're not about altnets. I know we are riding the altnet waves, uh, 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 but uh, certainly we see uh, yourselves, Vodafone, PXC, uh, BT Wholesale, all going to be there as suppliers to the market. Uh, Later on, so we see the Fiber Cafe as uh, providing that vibrant ecosystem, which will stay. Um, and, and I don't think anyone thinks that ecosystem will contain the majority. Not the majority is not fair. We'll have 101 old nets. I think you're right. We will end up with probably five or six eventually going down, and there will be some rural ones as well. Uh, and you've got some special areas like Hull um, as well. Uh, but I think our business plan is to be an aggregator of the ecosystem, not the altnets. Mm. Uh, and I think aggregator is probably the wrong word as well, because you know PXC is an aggregator. 
what we provide is that unified interface into the platform uh, itself. So uh, what that gives us the ability to do is uh, add, so it started with lead to cash, we were doing T2R. It also gives the ability to add uh, other products as well. So we're looking at adding voice onto the platform as a, uh, so you can have that as part of the journey as well. Uh, and I also, and I, th I think it's a conversation probably you thought about it, it's is it in-house or third party? And I think that differentiation is somewhat artificial because it's not about in-house or the Fiber Cafe. We are ultimately a technology platform. Mm -hmm. And what we do is that we make in-house quicker, cheaper, and easier to manage and maintain. I mean, if I ask you your development, you're not developing everything in Assembler today. Uh, you know, you're using software libraries to make your uh, development faster and quicker. And what we see ourselves as is that we, we sit in that space and you're st it's still an in-house development. And I think that's a mindset that people have. It's like, I want to build everything, but you are building. And this is still in-house, you still own. We do not resell anything. We do not prioritize any suppliers. We purely act as a technology enabler in that space. Yeah, so... So, so we see that... Uh, I'm just going to sort of go back to the question as well, because um, so we started in the short term, the Fiber Cafe was... Uh, lead to cash. Mm -hmm. Now it's T2R. Uh, next phase of uh, that is uh, about analytics as well. So we're providing deep analysis of your orders, your success rate, response times, uh, what orders are getting through, which network is saving you better than the other network as well. So we're doing a lot of work uh, in that space as well. But if you look at the name of the Fiber Cafe, it was, you know, initially if, I, if it was a pure technology platform, we would have called it the Fiber Gateway. But it's not purely, it is a, a, you know, we don't call our members customers, they're members because we are involved with the industry, with uh, Inca, with ISPA, we work with the OTA, we work with Ofcom. So we create an environment where we're pushing for standards and we're building an ecosystem that is designed to assist and reduce costs for our members. So you'll see uh, Elevate has recently, a version of Elevate has been launched within the Fiber Cafe ecosystem, very much focused on ISPs. Uh, and it sort of uh, focuses on payments, um, OTS, our favorite subject uh, in that yes. space, uh, uh, contracts, uh, early term etc. et cetera. So that's sitting in the Fiber Cafe ecosystem as well. Um, and we are looking at and analytics, as I said earlier, to add to that. And also uh, we're looking at uh, going up into customer service and down into the network as well. So it's a wide array of solutions within the Fiber Cafe ecosystem. Yes, I guess what you're saying is, is, is you built a business based on a single supplier, that being yeah. OpenReach. So actually you've, you've got the opportunity even after the consolidation to have a successful software product. And it sounds like yeah. from a, the ISP's perspective, like Zen's perspective, you just do a lot of the stuff rather than us well, trying to reinvent the We wheel do a lot of the stuff adult. that is not a differentiator for yourself. Yes. So you know, why would you, the question is, as long as the commercial is right, yeah. why Why would you, um, you know, you, as you start dealing with Altnets, which I believe you're going down that route now, you'll discover that the Altnets are not necessarily as savvy when it comes to supporting developments and APIs as you'd expect them to be. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, and I think we shield love our customers from that. Uh, when we see defects, uh, we do workarounds. Uh, when uh, some of the su uh, suppliers do not have development environments, we have simulators for them. Um, so from a short-term perspective, especially with the consolidation lottery, is why would you develop multiple stacks? And multi it's not just the initial development. It's, 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 uh, it's a continuous investment in terms of... Uh, uh, maintaining that interface, updating it, and also the, the support element that comes with that. So, you know, we, from a support perspective, take care from a significant number. You know, we can see where the order failed and we understand our suppliers' uh, provisioning system. In many cases, we help them build it uh, as well. Yeah. You, you use the term consolidation lottery, and yeah. uh, I, I quite like that <laughs> because we don't know what's going to happen. We know things are going to yeah. happen and things are happening. And you've had a lot of experience in the industry. What's your view of where the industry is today in terms of the UK full fiber build? And yeah. you mentioned we might have three, four, or five scale players 
uh, let's say at 20, 30. So, yeah. so, but I'd like to hear in your own words, where are we today? Where are we going? What's going to happen? Blimey. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, I think consolidation is a given. So uh, you know that. And I've, I've heard your presentations and um, I think... You've gone for the two or two to three uh, in, in your... Is that right? Yeah, I, I would... I mean, my own vote for 2030 would be yeah. four to six scale players in the UK, yeah. of which that is Openreach is one. Yeah. VMO2, Next Fibre and yeah. some acquisitions is, is another. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking two or three other scale players, yeah. which would get to four and, or five, and then yeah. there'd be a lo load of rural... There'll be a bunch of rural a bunch. And I think that number probably will not exceed 10 eventually yeah. uh, as, as they go. Um, I, I think I broadly share that. And, and I think that our business model was never based on uh, unifying the interface to 100 uh, altnets, um, ultimately. Uh, but we, you know, we, we're, look, we're seeing, if you look at the market, uh, there's a B2C market and there's a B2B market as well. And you're starting to see specialist B2B products on some of the providers as well. So I, I see that as developing. Uh, I think the, the B2C world is a scale world, and that's where scale networks uh, come in. The B2B market is slightly different as well. And this, there's slightly more room there for some of the openness to specialize in that space uh, as well. And I think we're sort of seeing that in some cases, I think, because ultimately... You know, margins and uh, requires scale on B2C and it, it does not. And if you've built your own vertical ISP, you're discovering that it's a lot harder uh, to sell than you thought. It. Yeah, definitely. Let, let's move on to your billing platform, Elevate, which mm -hmm. we, we love that. We've you've been using it for years. Works really, really well. Um, very much PSTN, WLR3 call rating mm -hmm. based. And of course, the the PSDN is being yep. switched off. It was going to be switched off the end of next year. They've knocked it down the road a little bit. Yep. Um, but what is the future for your billing platform beyond WLR3 when it does So the billing disappear? platform, or Elevate, was never built with PSDN at the core of it. Um, okay. Um, so uh, if, you, if you look at our customers, uh, the majority are actually managed service providers who are selling... Okay. Uh, packages we do contract I, I think you use part of it uh, certainly and when it comes to rating it's not about call rating it's about event rating uh, as well so that these events could be uh, cloud usage uh, it could be anything so the platform is um, and that's very different from other channel because other channel platforms were born from a, you know there's very much CLI centric if you speak to your team here you see the elevate is not CLI centric, it is service centric. So it's designed to build services and combine services. It offers features like multi-brand, multi-currency. Uh, so especially the managed service providers were acquisitive, they're able to acquire businesses, but the elevate uh, banner and then merge as, the, as they see fit. We've got a lot of focus on contract, contract management, uh, uh, early termination charges, uh, how this is done dynamically, uh, payment, and we're part of our Elevate uh, ISP, uh, which will be available to all customers very soon, is a, a very rich analytics program uh, or interface that for many companies, it's not worthwhile investing on their own to do this, uh, you know, creating a data lake and pushing that data, slicing, dicing that data. So whilst certainly Zen has a PSDN history of using the platform. Actually, the majority of our customers are not using it for PSTN. Also, there's a mobile element as well, but the majority are managed service providers or ISPs. Okay, so so do you see any negative impacts when the PSTN disappears, or do you think that will no, just be replaced uh, I think with makes, other... No, the only impact uh, is a change from rating to subscription. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, that's how we see uh, the market changing, whether it's PSTN or not. Uh, it really makes no difference at all uh, to us. And uh, three, four years ago, there was this push, everything's going to be subscription. And now we're seeing actually it's not. It's going to be a blended model uh, between the two. And the subscription certainly needs to be absolutely strong. And, and that's why we invested a lot in the subscription part of Elevate. But certainly from a 
rating perspective, event rating, that's making a comeback, even sort of the big names. If you look at Zora, for example, who's uh, seen as the uh, the unicorn uh, in that space, have recently acquired an event rating company and their latest white paper stopped talking about subscriptions. And they're talking about the value of events and giving the customer the choice between the two. So it makes no difference to us what you bill. Uh, and I think certainly the majority of our customers use it for, to build for a variety of things. Some even use it to build for website creation. Um, it's quite flexible. Yeah. Well, I mean, we use it ourselves beyond yeah. core rating as well. Yeah, and, and I think um, certainly it's worthwhile. And I think we should arrange a session to explain some of the new features because they're certainly relevant to Zen as well. Yeah. We'll, we shall definitely do that. Yeah. Let's uh, finish by talking about AI because I believe your software teams are experimenting with AI. So where what are you doing? Where yeah. do, you, do you see the potential? Have you got any stuff in production yet? Uh, so, well, a pr well, AI is one of those words that everyone's using. Uh, AI. Mean very little or a lot. Uh, but ultimately, I think we both agree that it's going to change how we do things in the, in the near future significantly. Uh, now, certainly we've been using AI, if you use a better word, as part of our development process, uh, uh, as part of uh, the PR, publicity, content creation. But we also at SI, we spend a significant amount of our revenue, well, a reasonable amount of our revenue on pure R&D. We've got a culture that rewards and promotes, what shall we do this? And we've got two tracks that I find really interesting. Uh, one is actually because of our route through T2R, and what we're doing is to creating agents that work at the network level, whether it's Nokia, Atran, to look, analyze at the 101 million or millions of alerts that are coming out of these and create uh, an understanding of what that means in terms of quality of service and potential faults and how that will integrate to the T2R journey. So I think we're doing a lot of work in that space. That's very interesting. And at some point, I think, you're more than welcome to join us for a private demo of, of some of these things as well. And the other area, because we're creating this, uh, I guess, the cafe where our focus is saving our customers money, time, effort. We're also looking north of the stack where we're looking at uh, sentiment analysis, uh, combining that with how customers are interacted previously, their payment history um, as well. Uh, and in and two ways, one is uh, how that, may potentially impact churn. And the other one, which is probably more uh, short term, is how to respond to a customer contact point, whether it's phone, email, WhatsApp, or whatever channel. So both are really interesting. Uh, and I think we're the environment that we create strategic imperatives allows people to come up with ideas. And, and uh, some ideas never catch on. But those two have certainly differ going from strengths to strengths. Yeah, great. Great culture, and certainly at Zen, we've we've seen some pretty good success with yeah. AI, particularly with our chatbots that are taking nearly four thousand chats a month now, and and they're doing really well. I mean, not all chatbots are created equal. Some are... no, I think the idea of chatbox <laughs> when it came, it was a little bit earlier than they should have done. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you remember Elisa in the old days. Is it Elisa? Oh yes, um, Lisp um, days and yeah, all that. The Lisp days, you know, it was. Amazing, but then you know you, you reach the limitation within about twenty seconds. Uh, yes. I feel not well. Why do you feel not well? That sort of thing. Um, you know, we move. If you look at the early chatbots that were just next level up from that, but from the ones that are coming out now, where they actually harnessing the information, the knowledge, um, then and I think we had a chat earlier. You're saying they're working really well for Zen as well. Yeah, yeah, they're working really well. I mean, as I say, not all chatbots are created equal. Some, yeah. some out there are frustrating. Yeah. Um, I, I think ours is, I would say, is really, really good. Um, and it, it doesn't, um, it lets you hand off to a human very easily if you want to do that, rather than trying to contain you yeah. in a room that you can't get out of, even though you're not, you're not getting your question answered. So lots of, yeah. lots of scope. Uh, final question on AI, and I put this question to the audience of links about large language models. Do you think that LLMs are showing the early signs of true intelligence, or are they just clever algorithms that happen to be particularly good at predicting the next word? That's a very difficult question. Um, 
I think we're almost at the border between the two. Um, if we're going to sort of talk about intelligence, then it becomes quite philosophical of what's intelligence and are we just, some people are processing data better than others or looking at it better than others. But whatever way you define it, we're certainly not there yet. Uh, but you can certainly argue I mean, um, that we're at the border. I'm not sure if it's true intelligence, but in three or four years' time, I think I can give you a much better answer uh, than today. That, that, that revolution is, is not a fad. Uh, it's something that's going to develop, extend, and we're going to see it used everywhere. Uh, but whether we use it for intelligence purposes or pure automation purposes, I am not 100% sure yet. Do we use it to design something or do we use it to analyze data to predict a fault or a weakness? Well, I don't think we'll have to wait very long no, to find out. I don't think so. I shall invite you back in three or four years. I look forward to it. And we'll find out. Well, that's been fantastic. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you.